are going live um, and you guys are live. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a Zoom discussion of Goodbye Columbus. I'm Nadine, the Philip Roth Personal Library Librarian at the Newark Public Library, and I look, look forward to learning more about this work. Please feel free to type any questions or comments in the chat or in the Q&A as they come to you, and we'll address them after we hear from our host. Please know that if you're using the chat, please do send the message to all pan panelists and all participants so that everybody can see your question. This webinar is also being recorded. Our host today is Stephen J. Zipperstein, Daniel E. Koshland Professor in Jewish Culture and History at Stanford University. The author and editor of nine books, including Pogrom, Kishinev, and the Tilt of History, and Rosenfeld's Lives, Fame, Oblivion, and the Furies of Writing. Stephen is currently writing a biography of Roth for Yale's Jewish Lives. It is my pleasure to introduce Stephen to the group who will talk about Goodbye Columbus. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm sorry I can't see you. I, I'd like to watch facial muscles in order to gauge reactions. And um, so I'm just gonna have to use my imagination and uh, I'll speak for about 15 minutes and then open up for discussion. So speaking about imagination with regard to Philip Roth, I mean, Roth often acknowledged that he needed uh, a kind of concrete basis with which to, to use in order to shape his fiction and as I've come to learn while writing this book, which I hope and expect to finish in this calendar year, at least in terms of a workable draft, um, uh, he, he drew from life far more promiscuously than he would often acknowledge. I, uh, I just um, was just reviewed his uh, the notes that he took while writing Operation Shylock, a book of his uh, published in the mid 90s, um, 93, I think. And um, uh, he uh, there's a character in it, Ziad, George Ziad, uh, who um, very eloquently, if also profoundly excitedly, um, is speaking about the Palestinian cause. And Roth uh, assiduously uh, insisted that Ziad um, um, bore, bore no resemblance to Edward Said. And, and right there in the jottings that he wrote down in preparing Operation Shylock, he writes George Said and in parentheses Edward Said. And um, so the, 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 the connection between um, life and art, um, while uh, difficult to, um, to, 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 to construct, consequently, any credible literary biography of him is incredibly difficult to write. The relationship is far closer than Roth himself would often acknowledge, but he did acknowledge that he drew from experiences, um, and certainly Goodbye Columbus um, is in, in many ways drawn from um, his own life, and in other ways, is not, and I'll try to suggest that interplay um, in my brief remarks. Um, it's well known that the book, um, the novella, written very, very quickly within a span of weeks at a at a thousand words, um, a clip of a thousand words a day or so, he later explained, um, was uh, drawn from experience. A um a romance, in fact, a two and a half year romance, um, with a um uh, a girl out of high school. He met her when he had graduated college at twenty one. Met her at a um, summer camp, um, when she asked him to hold, uh, her her glasses, as uh, described in the first gorgeous paragraph in Goodbye Columbus, and 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 many of the stories that he wrote at the time that went into Goodbye Columbus, into the collection Goodbye Columbus published in 59, and that was much celebrated almost immediately at the time of his publication. Um, almost all the stories were actually either drawn from his own experiences or from the experiences of uh, 
of 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 others. Um, uh, Epstein um, about a middle aged Jewish man who has an affair with a woman across the street. I think not next door. Um, is it seems drawn from the experience of Sid, the owner of 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 Sid's uh, luncheonette, um, who often came to um, the luncheonette late. Um, and uh, his his wife was a hard, much harder worker. He was particularly late one morning. She came home to find him in, in bed with the next door neighbor. Um, uh, Sid, um, after divorce, Sid opened up a branch um, on Bradley Beach, as I recall. And um, the uh, uh, conversion of the Jews it was a story told to him by a good friend of his, Arthur Geffen. And um, uh, Philip apparently promised not to use it and then used it. Um, um, uh, the uh, uh, and defender of the faith, the, the probably probably the most controversial story included in the collection Goodbye Columbus um, about a uh, uh, a Jewish shirker in the military was or so it seems I'm not ready to write this down, but I'm ready to sort of, of float the idea was it seems based on Philip's own experience, several friends of his who had served with him in um, the army talked about how, um, though incredibly popular um, in his battalion, he um, he tried to get out of every onerous task that he possibly uh, could. It, and, and it was um, he who actually um, um, sought to be relieved of duties on Friday nights, as uh, does the character in um, in uh, um, Defender of the Faith, by saying that he um, he had to go to synagogue, something that Philip Roth um, certainly didn't do, um, uh, except for the rare rare occasion. Um, the, the, just parenthetically, the, the 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 shirker in Defender of the Faith is named Sheldon. Sheldon is a name that Roth would often use to speak about characters, to describe characters who he 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 felt were unpleasant. If you remember in Port Norris Complaint, um, the uh there's a point, there's a passage where uh Port Norris is saying, you know, it's amazing that I'm actually a heterosexual. And given my background and relationship with my mother, um, um, I should have come out. Uh, as a homosexual, and then he sort of um, has a, a few paragraphs about what um, he might have been like as a homosexual, and um, and and he, he, there he's named Sheldon. Um, goodbye, Columbus itself. It's it's it amazes me in rereading it how fresh and alive and poignant and um, intelligently also mean-spirited the book the book is. Um, one aspect of Philip Roth's talent is that here are writing good by Columbus written in his mid-20s. He actually integrates an entire body of critical literature none of which he actually cites here. He'll later, in later works, he'll actually cite Conrad, Kierkegaard, and other 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 books that are preoccupy him. Here he he doesn't, but what seems clear is that the book in many ways is a gloss on um a, a um at the time very um um widely discussed sociological tract um by um by David Reisman, The Lonely Crowd. And um, a book that argues that in post-industrial America, an America sh whose um, population is inordinately shaped shaped by by um, advertising and, and television, uh, one is seeing increasingly what David Reisman calls outer directed people, people who 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 uh, whose whose judgments about themselves are based on the um, judgments of others inordinately, rather than um, a strong sense of self that they're able to carry through life. And in many ways, Brenda Potemkin is a uh, an object lesson, a test case of 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 an um, other directed person. The um, he, they make love at the outset um, in front of a, a television screen. She seems um, far more passionate than anything else about the need to uh, buy clothes 
in better stores than than Orbox. Um, um, all she really says about Neil, in many ways, from beginning to the end of their relationship, depicted as a summer romance um, in the novella, is um, that she likes the way Neil looks. Um, it, it's not clear, and, and and this is something we might want to talk about, is um, what he actually feels about her and it's certainly unclear as to what he what she feels about him um nearly everything about her that he um uh reacts to with the outset of the relationship except for her body um he dislikes uh her the comment about um going to school in boston rather than actually saying that she she goes to Radcliffe, um, the way in which she plays tennis until it's dark in order to uh, protect her nose after a, a nose job, her disparaging remarks about um, about Newark. Um, it's um, and, and in many ways, um, it seems to me the relationship is um, his reaction to the relationship is um, by and large one of annoyance except during the um the sex scenes and and roth here and elsewhere though roth is known to be a writer enormously preoccupied with sex and he is a writer preoccupied with sex um he writes very sparingly about sex um uh, one or two scenes here in the novella um not in any great detail elsewhere in his in his work by 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 and large and um, in some ways, the the way in which the novella develops and finally culminates in um, the whole snafu around the diaphragm is, I think, for the character uh, Klugman, um, um, an exercise in in power. He um, he feels in the relationship that he's um, in a relationship of servitude, uh, a status in the, in the family um, that is um, in some ways even um, at a lower level than that of the, um, the maid. And, um, and, uh, and in, in many ways, it seems to me, and, and you may disagree, that the, um, his insistence on Brenda getting a, a diaphragm is, um, is, overwhelmingly an, an, an effort to actually assert himself, to assert himself finally in a relationship. And um, and and what's striking, one of the striking features of this book, aside from its just fluency and poignancy um, and um, mixed with uh, extraordinary capacity at dialogue and 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 laced, with a, a sort of um, a, a kind of anger, um, an anger from the outset at uh, Brenda, um, and um, and I forget where that sentence was actually going to go because I was going to point out an aspect of the of the book that uh, that just slipped my mind. Um, so um, just uh, just a reminder of um, Roth's capacity already in the in his mid twenties to describe, describe the world around him. Um, he, he writes to a friend or it's actually says to a friend about a decade later in a conversation about his writing career that in many ways, what Goodbye Columbus was about, um, he puts it this way. One thing I was trying to do with Goodbye Columbus was to kick the past. Um, and um, it's, um, it's a it's a it's a a, a a love song in many ways to Newark and it's built out of a capacity to say goodbye to Newark and um and then of course much like Joyce um at least in his imagination he never leaves Newark and um and then writes about it um incessantly throughout the rest of his life um one one paragraph that has always struck me is when um, Neil has just uh, visited Potemkin um, Sinks and he's um, in the family car 
and driving out just beyond the uh, the city and he um he um he spots um at this park a group of women um some of whom as he writes i recognized as high school mates of mine they compared sun tans supermarkets and vacations they looked immortal sitting there their hair would always stay the color they desired their clothes the right texture and shade in their homes they would have simple swedish modern when that was fashionable and if um and if huge ugly baroque ever came back out would out would go the long mid-legged um um uh marble coffee tables and it would come in um, um other furniture these were the goddesses and if i were in paris i could not have been able to choose among them so micros microscopic were the differences their fates had collapsed them into one um i think the one one challenge that i've found in writing about goodbye columbus a particularly pronounced challenge is um is in as much as the book is modeled in one way or another on um a a, a woman a, a girl then uh that he dated for two and a half years um um in the process of writing my biography i've come to be acquainted with that girl now a woman in her 80s um uh incredibly impressive woman uh very talented uh um beautiful um and um it seems highly unlikely that the Brenda Potemkin in the novella would have actually matured into that woman and one of the challenges in writing biography is that once you actually get to know someone who's being described in a literary work that you're analyzing it then consequently shapes or can shape or almost invariably shapes in one way or another even though you struggle with it your portrait of that person as portrayed in fiction um, 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 more than half a century earlier in other words to some extent as I reread Goodbye Columbus um, I think of of this woman who I've come to know somewhat and feel um, the portrayal of her to the extent to which the novella is portraying her is unfair I'm um, it, it's hard to know to what extent that sort of engagement with a literary work is legitimate or not I struggle with this myself I have a draft and I may recast the draft um perhaps even after speaking with those of you today um in other words there are aspects of a literary work that you end up understanding differently better perhaps worse um more accurately more inaccurately after you actually meet some of the people who are in one way or another portrayed in the work and um, um getting to know someone in this way could deepen one's understanding of a work it might also detract um and it's one of the the many struggles um I've had in writing um a book about one of the um most um elusive literary biographical figures one could possibly write about what if I stop there and um and let's uh let, let's talk Uh, we have a question from Howard. Howard, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, and you can ask a question and make your comment. Hi. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Professor Zipperstein. Um, I wanted to know if it's true that, uh, <clears throat> two-part question, now, is it true that um, Philip Roth detested, did not like Hollywood's depictions of his works, you know, in Goodbye Columbus, Poor Nice Complaint, and the ones that followed? Um, and, I, and I ask also, interesting to note that Philip Roth died on actor Richard Benjamin's 80th birthday. So I make a little joke. Maybe that was a, a some subtle, subtle uh, thing from Roth uh, in, in regards to his uh, detestment of Hollywood's treatments of his plays, of his, of his novels. 
Uh, look, almost all of the movie portrayals, almost all, all the movie versions of Philip Roth's books are detestable by any standard. And um, uh, and um, his his work is is built in so many many ways out of out of words. Most of his books are built out of conversation between between people, and how you actually transform that into a film is immensely complicated. It's possible. I mean, the French do it better than we do, but um, but most of the films are are terrible. Um, I've actually looked at various versions of of some of the films. Some of the ver in earlier versions were better than the final versions. It seems to me, and I'll write about some of those in in my book. Uh, he he didn't hate the film version of Goodbye Columbus, and um, or at least he hated it less than he hated most of the other um, uh, film um, adaptations. Um, his relationship to film from the outset was very complicated. Uh, and um, uh, partly he was convinced, and of course he he really um, rose to some degree of prominence in his 20s by writing a series of, of um, film reviews to the New Republic, um, and um, all of which he hated, as I recall, and um, not his articles, but the films. And... Um, I mean, he was convinced that film was going to detract from reading. He also, uh, I think, is is from the outset intensely competitive, and um, and the prospect of film competing with literature, um, he um, he worries about. At the same time, I mean, he's he uh, when he's when he's um, in need of money, especially during the um, years when he's wrestling with um, alimony payments to uh, to his first wife. He um, seriously thinks of going to Hollywood and writing film. And at the same time, once um, otherwise serious writers like J. J. Bruce uh, um, uh, Friedman, the author of Stern, actually begins to write um, um, uh, um, write film scripts, he disparages what Friedman is doing and looks down upon him. So like everything else in Roth, the answer to your question is complicated. Uh, but I think it's fair it's fair to say that nearly every film version of his book, um, uh, including American Pastoral, um, um, uh, The Dying Animal, um, which is uh, 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 comes was is, is known. The film is is known as Elegy, um, and um, I, I, including I think the HBO series, The Plot Against America. Um, there, I, I, by and large, I've watched them out of out of dutifulness, um, with with barely any enjoyment whatsoever. Thank you, Howard. Our next question is from Kate. Kate, Kate, go ahead. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. Um, my question is, I ask every Roth scholar that I come across. No, have you met? Was, have you met? Have you met a lot of them? Uh, every single book club. Okay, I all right. would ask you're, this you're, question. You're, Why you're was he not person. given the uh, Nobel Prize? What do you think? You are in your words. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. The question is, um, would I have given Roth a Nobel Prize? No. Why was he not given? What is your spin on that? Uh, you, you know, as much research as you do, there's some things that r remain um, uh, impossible to actually um, know. And so I'm... I'll, I, I, um, I'll, I'll never know why I, I think Roth probably was more or less right. Um, it did seem as if toward the end, the Nobel Prize Committee was searching um, every rural part of Romania in order to find someone to give it to uh, um, instead of Roth. And um, uh, though my, my sense of the the achievements of Dylan, um, uh, I, I, I think my sense of Dylan's achievements are are, are greater than than Roth um, attributed to him. The um, I uh, you know it was pointed out from almost the very beginning of Roth's literary career that um, it's it's hard to feel neutral about Philip Roth, and um, and uh, in I I first read. Philip Roth, uh, at the age of 17, about to leave for rabbinical school. I was raised as an Orthodox Jew, and but I had subscriptions to most of the literary magazines. And I remember just before leaving for yeshiva, I read in Partisan Review, Whacking Off. 
And um, the interplay between reading, whacking off, and then going to rabbinical school in many ways has more or less defined my subsequent life. And um, so I've, I've, uh, Philip Roth has been the voice, the literary voice in my head um, ever since, ever since then, whacking off was hard to forget. The, um, uh, I, I think my sense is that uh, just judging from reactions to his Booker Prize, there are very strong reactions to uh, to Roth, one of the judges who actually um, resigned from the Booker Prize when um, Roth won it, um, talked about how reading Roth feels as if someone's just sitting on top of your top of your head. I think that's the way she characterized it. And um, and perhaps some members um of the jury at Stockholm uh, just, uh, uh, um, uh, concurred um, whether the impact of the Claire Bloom book was um, as great, great an influence on the decision. I, I don't know. To, to, just briefly, to what extent does my answer, um, is it consistent with the many, many other questioners that you've interrogated with the same question? Has anyone actually answered your question to, in ways that that has, has satisfied has satisfied you? Oh no, it was very curious. At some point, somebody actually said that the Prague orgy was the reason why Swedish people hate Philip Roth because there were two Swedish girls and uh, in the book, and it was not very pretty. So that was the most interesting answer that I kind of no, never no, mine, mine is Mine's far less interesting. I, 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 I don't think, my, my sense is um, that he's not hated in, 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 in Sweden. Uh, he's actually uh, been quite lauded by Swedish literary critics. Um, and um, uh, and, and the, the, the portrait of the two Swedish girls is, 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 is not, in my reading, um, perhaps the most uh, um, vivid, um, disturbingly vivid portrait of relationships between men and women. And of course, Sweden is actually best known these days in cultural circles for, for producing some of the darkest, most disturbing detective stories. And so why why the Swedes would feel that Roth is more dark than those uh, would puzzle me. So I'd, um, anyway, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm dubious about that answer. Thank you, Kate. Uh, just to note, I am uh, addressing questions in the order they came in. We will try to get to everybody. So I'll go through the Q&A um, and the chat, and I see some raised hands as well. Um, question from anonymous attendee. What is the best way to get in contact with you in case we want to share any personal anecdotes about meeting Roth? Um, I'll, uh, I'm easily contactable. Um, all academics are. Um, it's just szipper at stanford.edu, and I'd, I'd love to to hear um, more anecdotes, although the more anecdotes I, I hear, the I may never finish this book. And so, uh, I mean, not, not too many, but just uh, an adequate number. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I just put that email address into the chat. Uh, next is Lawrence. Lawrence, go ahead. Lawrence, please. Can you yourself. hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Uh, do you think Roth's works are misogynistic? <laughs> Tough crowd, Nadine. You know, it's I've I'm, I have to actually answer about why he has to win the Nobel Prize, and now, and now this. Um, I I um, it Roth is uh, very much a man of his age and perhaps more so. And um, uh, e enormous sexual drive. Uh, I think Blake Bailey's book is inordinately preoccupied with his after hours activities, but um, the, the list of women that, um, is included in Blake Bailey's book is by no means definitive. And um, having said that, is that how much of that um, in life is a sign of misogyny? Um, no, I, in his work. I, I, in I, his work. I, I understand. I, I'm I'm just winding around, winding okay. around your question, and then and then I promise to hit it. Okay. Um, 
I, um, I mean, of, of course, that's the, um, that's the um, uh, uh, biggest issue, the link, most lingering issue with regard to Roth. My inclination with regard to Roth is not to use that term. I think it's far too reductive. Um, and uh, he um, he's he's in awe and also at times in fear as a writer of the power of sexuality and um, and in fear, his characters are often terrified by the prospect of what they'll lose um, more so than what they'll gain if they um, fall prey to um, the intensity of, of sex. Um, and, and this is consistent with Roth's lifelong preoccupation as a writer with what one gains and loses from human relationships, to what extent they're, they're a drain, to what extent they're essentially gratuitous. That's, that's among the pro most pronounced themes in Letting Go. Um, his fear of, of of being in servitude to to Brenda Potemkin, I think, is one of the um, most salient themes in Goodbye Columbus. So, um, what I would, what the way in which I might rephrase the terminology you're using, is that um, Roth is ever as a writer and as a man and the two are sort of uh, were, are intimately interlinked, is ever in fear of losing one's control over oneself. And the, to the extent to which one most more, more likely than not loses control over oneself, it's um, with sex. And, um, and so um, I think that better characterizes Roth than the use of the word misogyny. Um, and as has often been pointed out, um, certainly late in life and in many ways throughout his life, some of the people closest to him are immensely impressive women. And um, most of the, I was at the his funeral at Bard, and most of the speakers there were women, though, as one pointed out to me, when a man dies at 85, it's mostly women who are at the grave. And um, so I, um, I, I'd, I'd resist that term. And, um, and I'd resist the use of a kind of cultural presentism um, in order to understand a person like him who came of age when he did. Now, why don't you, if you want, uh, argue with me a little bit, okay? No, no, I don't think so. It's just that I always hear from women that they think he is. I don't think so. But uh, 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 there seems to be a, a thing out there that you touched on about the Nobel Prize uh, problem, why, why he wouldn't get it. There seems to be this, this view out there, at least among women and perhaps critics, that he was, that his characters, his female characters, are not uh, uh, admirable people. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of his male characters are not admirable people. I don't know that Neil Klugman is an admirable person. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the character in the Defender of the Faith who's trying to get out of all military duty is not an admirable person and may have been modeled on Philip. Um, and um, uh, you don't worry about writing about admirable people when you're you're trying to be a, a novelist. Captain Ahab is not an admirable person and he's gotten a lot of play. So, um, and so I, um, uh, his, his uh, how many admirable males does can one no, no, I, identify? And so, no, I'm, I know we're not arguing, but I, I, I'm just not sure that that would be the um, this a, not that's not an entirely legitimate way of understanding Roth's work. Roth, 
Roth is um, immensely, immensely complicated as a writer and as a man, and and um, and is constantly contradicting what it is that he's saying. He wrestles his entire life with what it means to be attached to human beings, and he writes patrimony about his father, and um, he exasperates um, many readers and critics because book after book of his is different from the other books. And um, I mean, who who would follow up um, Goodbye Columbus with Letting Go? And then with When She Was Good, and um, the, the breast drives critics crazy, the baseball book, and um, and uh, uh, following the ghost writer um, with, um, with um, uh, 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 what is the follow the ghost writer? Uh, I'll come to me in 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 a moment. Operation Shylock, probably one of the most intelligent books written about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, um, uh, drives uh, John Updike to to the distraction. And um, so he's he's exasperating and brilliantly exasperating not only with regard to his portrayal of women and um uh with almost with regard to his portrayal of everything so um yeah so i um um that's how i would begin to answer your very pertinent question that causes me sleepless nights do you <laughs> okay. know vivian do you know vivian gornick's essay about Roth and Bellow. Yes, yes yes and i know okay. vivian and um there, there's uh, just a a, a, a brilliant a uh, uh, novel, um, um, actually, oh, the, the, I could just turn to my shelf in a moment, um, actually, in, that portrays someone utterly impossible who actually refuses to go to her own birthday party, though people have been gathered, a novel um, modeled on Vivian Gornick. And um, and the author actually the author of the novel had the gumption to actually ask Vivian Gornick to blurb it, which 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 she did. <laughs> so yeah, Vivian Gornick has uh, is is a is a, is a very spirited um, 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 cr critic who has very strong opinions, um, and uh, not everyone would have agreed that communism was as romantic as Vivian portrays it in um, in one of her books. And so one could disagree with Vivian. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, next is Eric. Go ahead, Eric. Hi, Steve. Uh, 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 this is, uh, do, uh, we know one another? Yes, we do. We'll figure that out in a minute. Um, All right. Okay. Keep, keep me guessing, though. Three things. First, Goodbye Columbus is a great movie. I hope you were, when you said nearly all the movies are terrible. You were excluding Goodbye Columbus. Yeah, I, I was excluding Goodbye Columbus. Yeah. Okay. And and the uh, and anything anything Catherine Ross is in, I love. So so that, so I'm I'm I'm. That, uh, Catherine Ross is not. Yeah. It's it's Ali McGraw. Uh, and, Ali McGraw. Yes. As a yes. point of data, so it says introducing Ali McGraw. Uh, as a data point, the uh, tennis scene was filmed at Scarsdale High School. Uh, speak speak a little bit louder. I can't, I can't hear. The tennis scene was filmed at at Scarsdale High School. Um, point two, uh, also just kind of data wise, when I taught Roth to Brooklyn College students who had never heard of Philip Roth, but Wait, this is Eric, this is Eric Alterman. Of course it is. I just, I just, I just heard that sort of twinge in your voice. Yes, go on, Eric. Okay. When I taught Roth at uh, my, I taught a class just on Roth to Brooklyn College students who had mostly never heard of Roth and mm. were mostly women. I even taught Portnoy in that class. Um, the young women's reaction, almost uniformly, was that Roth was portraying misogyny, not, and, and the author was not misogynist. He was he was being critical of misogyny by portraying these characters who were whose misogyny was unsympathetic. So I, I thought that was interesting. They had no investment in any of these arguments over time. So, but my uh, argument with you today. I have other <laughs> this, this, by the way, is a, a former student of mine who's grown into a very distinguished uh, writer and journalist. Yes, sir. Literally, literally distinguished. Um, Pardon me. I'm literally distinguished. I'm a distinguished professor. Anyway, um, <laughs> dude, dude, here. I just finished um, Middlemarch, and a, and I recently took a class where I read Ulysses because I'm I'm saying I couldn't have read it without it. What do I care about James Joyce's friends and neighbors 
or George Eliot's Friends and Neighbors. I'm reading a novel. I, I, okay, I'm sorry for all the people whose feelings are hurt that I'll never meet and are not my problem, particularly with Roth's friends and certainly Saul Bellow is even crueler. But what I understand, and I understand that you have emotional issues with the, this poor woman who was the model for Brenda. But why is that of any concern to a reader? This is a word yeah. of fiction. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think it, it is in as much as if one wants to understand the interplay between um, art and life in the life of a, of a novelist, um, what it is he actually does with his material is, I think, crucial. And um, uh, many critics of uh, literary critics have made the case that the, to the extent to which rage enters into Roth's work, it's in the wake of that 1962 Yeshiva University incident where he feels he's being savaged by the audience. Um, and I, I think from, as I see it from the very outset, Roth is able to use whatever rage he has inside of him um, to create literary gold. And um, hence the interplay between the person who may have inspired Brenda Potemkin and the portrayal of Brenda Potemkin reveals something, it seems to me, perhaps even essential about who Roth was um, and early on. I, I and, so, and so that consequently, I think it is of some consequence to understand the relationship between what inspires um, the novel, the novella. Uh, he breaks up with uh, the woman who's um, who's he's portraying in one way or another in Goodbye Columbus. It, it breaks her her heart. The relationship, rather than a summer romance, um, extends over two and a half years. She fully expects to to marry him, as she's told me, and um, and then why it is when sitting down and writing about this incident, this this um, something he turns into an incident, he actually portrays her in the way that he does, I think says something about his relationship to the world, his and um, and something significant about what he's going to bring to the page. And so I would argue that's that is of consequence. Uh, no, I, I agree with everything you just said. Well, I, I rarely, I rarely heard that's such that's a sentence from you, Eric Alterman. That's a model, so yes, that's a that, that's a, that's an argument for a biography. What I'm saying, what I heard you say, is that it that it ought to affect our reading of the novel. And it, I, no, no, no you misheard me. Okay. It affects okay. my it it affects my reading of the novel, okay. and um and I worry that my getting to know this woman in old age affects adversely my reading of the novel. And that's something that I have to wrestle with as I move from reading the novel to writing about the novel. That that's what I meant to say. Actually, if I'm rooting for you to win that lesson, because I, like I said, I, I think there are two, it's very important to me. So when, when, when Bailey's biography came out- and it really Talk was, a little bit louder, Eric, because I'm-, I'm okay. when, when Bailey's biography came out and, and people were saying, oh, we have to reevaluate the work of Philip Roth, I felt very strongly that this is completely irrelevant to the work of Philip Roth. The when when Bailey's Philip say that when say that again when Bailey's biography when Bailey's came, out. came out and we and we learned all these un, unfavorable things about Roth, there was a, a great deal written that said, as a result of what we've learned about Roth's life, we need to reevaluate his work. And I strongly believe that's false it couldn't be wrong no, i i uh, look i i we i i don't have the time to speak about my reaction to to bailey's biography i i i'm writing a very different sort of book it seems to me the reason why one writes about roth and here i suspect will agree is to 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 look at what it is he does on the page and uh and not what what he does in bed um and um which plays an inordinately important role in in Blake's uh, Blake Bailey's book, and so there I, I completely uh, 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 agree with you. But the you know the literary biography is uh, is, uh, is 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 a curious enterprise. It's not only at the very core of it um, intrusive, um, but uh, from the vantage point of some readers, it's irrelevant. 
and um, and um, and one has to make a case. It seems to me, as as a writer, which I intend to do in my book, as to its relevance, the way in which it opens up Roth. It opens up Roth for me, and I I, I trust I'll be able to persuade you too. It's good to hear your voice, Eric. Okay, thank, thank you, Eric. Okay, we've got about five more questions. Uh, let's go in order. Uh, Amy, where is Amy? Uh, hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. This is Amy Pazorski, co-executive editor of Philip Roth Studies. Hello, Professor oh, Zippers. All my friends, Amy, hello. We're all here for you. <laughs> you said you like to see facial muscles. Just imagine us all smiling in support and nodding in agreement. Amy, um, Amy for those of you who don't know her, has a remarkably beautiful smile. Yes. Oh, thank you. So a comment and a question. The comment is, um, I was thinking about this when you said that Roth was more worried about the effects of sex than the pleasures. And that reminded me of a conversation I had with you him. My sense is he enjoyed the pleasures of sex too, but I, I just, I want to say that in his defense, but yes, go on. That is fair. Um, I, I once had a conversation with him about teaching Goodbye Columbus. And I said, all of the women in my class were so annoyed with Neil for having an opinion about her birth control. And he rarely raised his voice with me, but he said in his total defense, but he didn't want her to get pregnant, which I read very empathically now. Um, but the question is, in you know, just, just just interject, Amy, I'm, I'm not, I, I, he doesn't want her to get pregnant. That's, that's true. But I, I think that's something of a ex post facto reading by Philip right, of right, Goodbye fair. Columbus. The, the character, Neil Klugman is, is, I think it's fair to say, is finally exercising in his insistence on her getting the diaphragm. And I think this is this is pretty clearly represented in the text. He's he's simply tired of being her servant. He's simply tired of 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 falling into a situation comparable to that that he's convinced exists in the home between the mother and uh, and Brenda. And um, you remember there's that extraordinary sentence of Roth's where the the, the mother seems like a, a captive slave, um, um, essentially owned by by the daughter, Brenda. And so I, I think for, for Neil Klugman, maybe not for Philip Roth, but for Neil Klugman, the insistence of the diaphragm is more a byproduct of finally asserting himself than anything else. But I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, I love that reading. I'm, I thank you for it. Um, my question was, I was wondering if during an event hosted by the Newark Public Library, you wanted to say something about Roth's send up or this affectionate description of the Newark Public Library and Goodbye Columbus. Yeah, um, you know, of course, some of the most beautiful moving scenes in the book have to do with the interplay between Neil Klugman, librarian, um, and an African-American boy who's um, who's looking at um, Gauguin's um, uh, reproductions of Gauguin's uh, uh, paintings of Tahiti, and you know, and I some some critics have felt what Roth, young Roth, is doing is heavy handed. I think one could excuse a twenty five year old writer for being somewhat heavy handed, but there's um, in many ways what he I think is clearly doing um, is um, is portraying the juxtaposition between the boy's desire to actually visit at least metaphorically Tahiti and his desire to to perhaps um, 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 uh, capture a place in what he describes as short hills, um, um, in the hills above um, um, steaming Newark and, um, and linking his life with, with Brenda. It's, um, it's uh, um, that part of it is, is really beautiful. I, I think probably even more moving is um, the, the paragraph toward the beginning, the paragraphs toward the beginning of the novella where he talks about his attachment to Newark, and um, and um, you know a, a city large enough to be a city, but where you could be pretty much assured that you'd actually see people you know on the street, and um, and he he's he never he never he 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 discovers I think with Goodbye Columbus and subsequent work that Newark is a treasure house for him. I think his part of what remains with Philip till the end is a kind of sense of surprise 
um, that not only that he was able to do as much as he did as the being the son of an insurance salesman who didn't get beyond eighth grade and growing up in a house with um, with with no more than three or four or five books, but he's um, all the more surprised that he managed to do what he did as a boy from Newark. And um, I think that um, um, it's, a, it's a sense of astonishment that never leaves him. And, uh, and, and it's one of the many ways in which Newark resonates within him. I'm not sure that with regard to his portrait of the, the library, aside from um, the, um, the description of the relationship with the African-American boy, the rest of the pieces, descriptions are sort of set pieces um, that um, don't jump out of the page for me. Uh, but certainly the interplay with the boy is extraordinarily uh, poignant. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. We've got time to squeeze in four more questions. So Roger, please, let me find you. Okay, go ahead, Roger. It, it seemed to me in reading the book again that um, having just read American Pastoral again, that the uh, Goodbye Columbus is like a prototype of a, a you know a younger writer who eventually matured into a much deeper, richer thinker. And it seemed to me that Ron in American in, in uh, Goodbye Columbus is the prototype for the Swede and the company that that the family worked in was a prototype for the Swedes company and there were just so many echoes and uh carrying through the the, the uh anger and rage that comes from from class class distinctions um uh kind of like it seemed like a rehearsal now in retrospect yeah and, and i pointed out in my chat that uh, when my family moved to uh, south orange uh, from Newark, my mother still shopped at Orbex, you know, religiously. Yeah, um, I think it. I think you're right when you when you point out that that Roth, throughout his life, and as much as he writes, and he writes way way more than he publishes, and even after he announces he stopped writing, he continues um, to write. Um, but um, throughout this uh, extraordinarily prodigious life, he tends to circle around um, a, a set of themes. And um, I think, you know, it's, um, I think this is true of many great writers, songwriters, uh, Van Morrison, uh, for example, Leonard Cohen. I mean, in many ways, the difference, as I see it, between a neurotic and an artist is what you do with it. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, um, and Roth um, will, I think, repeatedly circle around, as I mentioned before, just what human relations cost in terms of self. He's, um, from the very beginning, he's preoccupied with distinctively Jewish themes, um, with the Holocaust before the destruction of European Jewry is actually called that, uh, trying to write um, um, a uh, uh, something about Anne Frank that he finally does, of course, I think brilliantly in the ghost writer. Um, and um, he's writing a novel at the time when Houghton Mifflin um, begins talking with him about the prospect of Goodbye Columbus. He's writing a novel about a, uh, a Jew who wants to go to, to Frankfurt and to kill a German, any German. It seems probably based on comments that Herman, his father made about wanting to go to Germany and wreak, wreak revenge, although I, I'm not absolutely certain about that. And um, he, um, uh, so I think you're, you're in many ways right. He returns, it, it, the, it, one of his first real short stories, uh, The Day It Snowed, published in, in the Chicago Review, is a, is, um, is a story about death. And, um, and he's, he's, um, his, his, his preoccupation with death 
is prolonged and persistent and and deep and um and and uh, and in many ways informs many of his last novels and so i uh i think it, that's a, a beautiful way of putting it when talking about goodbye columbus as a sort of rehearsal but god well, what what a rehearsal yeah absolutely thank, thank you roger mort mort is next it's one second Hi, Mort. Mort, if you're ready, please unmute yourself. How am I doing? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. I, I'm one of those Newark born kids who uh, knew all the Potemkins. And uh, uh, the images are, are so vivid. Reading it again uh, now, uh, that's what he knew, right? He was 25 years old. That's what he knew. And as Roger, Roger's always ahead of me. Roger points out prototype for things going on. I mean, a 25 year old doesn't, can't have the sensitivity to, uh, to deal with the harsh people that, uh, that are subjects of the, of the later uh, books, some nasty folk, but, uh, but the Potemkins, and the Klugmans, uh, we know them, and they were decent folk. They didn't reach out to hurt anybody. Um, and uh, uh, it wasn't until patrimony that I, I thought, uh, you may disagree with this, it wasn't until patrimony that I thought he was talking about what he knew, be in part because I had a similar experience. But um, what, do you, uh, what do you mean? It wasn't until Patrimony that I mean, he talked about what he did. From, from uh, Goodbye Columbus, which was about the land I knew and the people I knew as a kid, uh, all the way to Patrimony, he, he was finding these very unpleasant, making these very unpleasant characters. That, that's my view of it. And one was nastier than the next. And, and you can use all kinds of uh, adjectives of their behaviors. But in part because uh, patrimony was so personal to me, uh, um, I felt that he was talking about himself much more than in the, in the interim work where uh, you know, there were pieces of him in there and some of his feelings, but that this was, uh, this was the ultimate expression of what he felt. And you don't share that. The, I, I mean, I, I think probably the all of the thirty-one books in total uh, constitutes the expression of himself, and um, and um, trying to capture that self um, is uh, has caused me intermittent insomnia, and so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that only comes out in patrimony. In many ways, you know, as uh, as he as one critic. When one novelist unfairly said the theme, the really the, the themes, the salient theme in, in all of Philip's Roth is himself, himself, himself. Uh, I think that's uh, a reductionist, but uh, but certainly one gets um, ample glimpses of of himself in the Zuckerman um, um, books, and um, and he's constantly responding in them um, to um, critical reactions of his work. Uh, and not only in a book like The Anatomy Lesson, which is probably the longest work in the English language that that it's a response to a, a, a literary review. So, um, uh, so I, I think one gets glimpses of himself throughout, and at the same time, he plays with all those um, those those glimpses. And and um, in many ways, I think the the chubby Lonoff in um in the ghostwriter is a, a, a philip's attempt to glimpse at himself um and um and is more modeled on self than than on 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 malamud or um or certainly Bashevis singer and um and uh so there um I mean, part of what is so exasperatingly impressive about roth is as i indicated before is how different book after book after book is, and um, and so with all, all, all of them, 
it seems to me, an expression of self, um, uh, not excluding the breast, and um, and um, and 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 none um, simply himself. And uh, so, in that respect, I I certainly agree with what Eric Alterman said before that one has to. It's 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 a mistake to collapse the man and his his literature. Um, and at the same time, I think it's it 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 augments one's sense of the of the making of the literature in order to understand as well as possible the self. And so, um, yeah, he, I think so. He appears in patrimony, but um, but um, he's 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 there inside the breast as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, Stephen, we have a very engaged audience with lots of questions. So, let me know. It's up to you. Would you like to wrap it up now, or can we? No, no, it's, it's fine. It's 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 fine. I mean, I I uh, I'm I, I'm here with you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Howard has another question. Go ahead, Howard. Wow. Hi. Good afternoon again, uh, everyone. Professor Zipperstein. It was mentioned before, a comment before about personal anecdotes and. One of the times I met uh, Philip Roth was at the mm -hmm. memorial for Charles Cummings, the famous Newark historian mm -hmm. who right. worked actually at the Newark Public Library. And this was about a year after the novel, The Plot Against America, had been published. And when reading The Plot Against America soon after it had been published, I noticed two um, factual mistakes in the book. Mm -hmm. Essentially, uh, Roth misidentified a famous Newark reform synagogue as conservative and a Newark conservative synagogue as reform. And at the memorial for, for, for Mr. Cummings, I, I spoke with Mr. Roth, Philip, and I said, and I told him that. And he um, leaned down, whispered into my ear, don't tell the Jews. And I told him I would not tell the Jews, I would not tell anyone, and I kept my promise until just now, today, right now, when I'm telling you and everyone on this panel, there there may there may be some Jews here. Yeah, um, yeah, I I I, I think that um, that the the fact that Philip perhaps on occasion couldn't tell a conservative synagogue from reform synagogue probably is not shocking and probably not his 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 greatest transgression. But thank yeah, you. no, and, and right, I was obviously you know it was fact checkers you know messed up as well for the book, but I don't know if it was corrected in a public subsequent publication. But I just think the comment that he made, "Don't tell the Jews," is such a Philip Roth thing to say, given you know the fact that the firestorm that he had dealt with after Goodbye Columbus and certainly Portnoy's complaint had been published in the in the in the sixties. Uh, uh, you know, just don't don't tell the Jews. I had enough from the Jews. You know, I'm I, Jewish. I, I started my research um, piecing together the details of Philip's various firestorms. And um and and as I said before, I mean certainly he was he was a writer from the very very outset that very few um critics could feel neutral about or felt neutral about. But at the same time, um Philip registered firestorms and tended to um dismiss um uh a praise. He actually says in in a um uh, in a, a conversation that I recently heard um, um, that had been taped, that um, when um, whenever he feels he, he says this uh, around the time around, around the time of the publication of Portnoy's complaint, he uh, just before in sixty eight, he he says in this conversation that um, w whenever I feel um, uh, uh, criticized, I take it I take the criticism deeply, but whenever I'm praised, I don't believe it. And um, and uh, he um, uh, even with regard to uh, the Jewish reactions to Goodbye Columbus, he was embraced far more um, uh, widely and eagerly, including by many Jewish leaders than he tended to acknowledge. And um, as and I, I was the one who discovered um, in the bowels of Yeshiva University the tape of the 1962 Yeshiva University event that he writes about repeatedly as an as a scandalous event when he was savaged by the audience. The audience loved him. And um and it, it's clear from the event, it's clear, it's clear from, from, from the tape. And uh, what he remembered, however, was at the end of the event, um, the people who didn't like him came up to the podium to complain to him. 
Now, essentially, at every Jewish event that I've ever attended in person, the people who don't like you come up at the very end and tell you that they don't like you. It's it's as it seems to me as as much of a Jewish cultural trope as the Passover Seder, and um, and that's that's what Philip took away from the event, um, and um, so that that again. I think it's a reminder, apropos of the exchange I had earlier with Eric Alterman, about the way in which once one learns about the writer, one actually um, perhaps gets a deep, deep, deepened sense of the 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 the, the temper of the work. So um, he um, uh, he 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 registered disapproval uh, deeply, um, and um, and and that was a, a feature of him uh, up through the end and. He managed to turn that uh, time after time into literary gold. Thank you. Ira, go ahead. What a wonderful discussion, Steve. Uh, from Ira, Ira Nadell, good to hear you. Good, good to hear your voice. My, uh, my, well, my, I, my, I my said friend I in uh, Yeah, thank you. Um, but I want to take issue with the notion of how you conceive of literary biography, the knowledge <laughs> that's of- That's a small topic, the, yes. It's a small topic. Nadine, we're going for two more hours. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And the use, of, the use of your word unfair in relation to the source, the figure who is the source for Brenda. And then you said you felt that Roth's representation of her in uh, Goodbye Columbus was unfair. Are you discrediting creativity and imagination? No, no, no. Um, you, 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 misunderstood, you, you misunderstood me, Ira. I, I, um, I, I'm not saying that that I, I'm I'm criticizing my own potential reactions. I'm not sure to what extent um, mine is a legitimate way of analyzing the story. I'm I'm worried that my sense of the story is now distorted because I've gotten to know. In old age, the uh, the person who 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 inspired his portrait of Brenda, but right. um, I, so I, I I I'm 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 far more critical of what I said than than you could possibly be, and um, and um, so I uh, you know in other words one to some extent my my comment about my my reading of Goodbye Columbus in the wake of getting to know the person who inspired Brenda um, um, is um, is an expression of my worry um, about the way in which um, meeting this person, I'll be a decades and decades later, and she might have more resembled Brenda when she was younger than she does now, and and perhaps and um, um, so I'm um, I, I was not expressing any sort of larger theory about the writing, the interplay between art and um, and, uh, and 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 I, and biography. I'm I'm expressing um, concerns about my own reactions. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's helpful. But the what fact that I'm uneasy is, 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 it satisfies you. <laughs> uh, moderately, but <laughs> my greater concern, my greater concern is your insomnia, and what we <laughs> as a Roth community can help in order <laughs> for you to become. I don't want to say more relaxed, but uh, less uh, anxious about some of these issues. I'm not trying to downplay the anxiety, but you've referred to insomnia at least three times. I think twice, but perhaps three times. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, now that I'm in the midst of writing and, and rewriting and, um, and, and trying to write um, a book that captures a, the voice of a writer whose voice is so extraordinary, and um, and um, how can one speak better or more accurately, more effectively about the life of Philip Roth than he himself spoke about the life of Philip Roth, and which he both did and he didn't. In you, you remember um, in Deception, I'm sure you remember in Deception when he's. Uh, the, the character of Philip Roth, let's put it, is um, is speaking to um, post coital conversation with his lover, and he uh, he's talking about the uh, the task of a future biographer of Philip Roth, and says, "My God, 
basically, and I can't remember the exact sentence, but the the, the task would be enormous. It's really, the, in a sense, um, what you're what you what you're facing is the very task of what it means to write literary biography, and um, so that um, that I see in many ways as my challenge. And um, so, I mean, I, I think it's worth losing a night or two of sleep, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. I do. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. We're going to continue this conversation in March at the Philip Roth Conference. But we, yeah, and you know, and um, you know, there, there, there's all sorts of the, the the news channels that you and I probably watch. CNN seem to be geared for people more or less our age with a, a plethora of advertisements about about um, how to spend a, a better night's sleep. And so um, I'll, um, I'll rely, I'll rely on, on your advice and I'll continue watching CNN. <laughs> oh, wonderful. All right, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Maybe okay. one last question. Sure. Uh, from Christopher Tiernan, uh, who does not have his microphone enabled, uh, can you please comment or share your thoughts on the article in the New York Times from two days ago, uh, Alexander Heman calling Roth's writing vile, deplorable, and full of lies? I, 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 I missed that. This was in the Times two days ago? Yes. It, this, this, this wasn't an article about Santos? This was an article about Philip Roth? Um, I will find it and I will put it in the chat. One second. Full of, full of lies. Okay. I mean, he is writing fiction. I mean, uh, he's. Okay. I, I'm not allowed to tell lies, but uh, but so so I, I like Hemans' work very much, and actually cited him in my last book, uh, Pogrom, A Kishnev in the Tilt of History. And um, can, can anyone give me a kind of quick, kind of summary of what he actually argues? Um, someone? Anybody want to raise their hand if you've seen the article? Okay, Eric. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. Eric, you're up if you want to unmute yourself and share. Um, so the first thing I'm saying is the Times is very excited. And, 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 and again, louder air. The Times is very excited about this because the headline is vile, deplorable, full of lies. Alexander Hemon is no fan of Philip Roth. <laughs> and then I scroll down. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, here we go. Um, they're, they're asking the question that they always ask, which is, what's the most overrated book? And he replies, I intensely disliked Philip Ross, The Human Stain. I found it vile and full of lies, but I finished it. Over time, it has revealed itself as being positively pro-Trumpist. Good God. American pastoral is deplorable, too. Ross Wait, human, human stain? is pro-Trumpist? Yes, positively pro-Trumpist. <laughs> American pastoral is deplorable too. Ross' steadfast commitment to the many privileges of male whiteness reliably repels me. I also dislike a lot of recent books, but I don't wish to name them. Bad books are as hard to write as the good ones. That's the entire response. Yeah, I, 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 I'd have to read the, 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 the piece. It sounds- um... Oh, that's the whole thing. Yeah, that's the whole thing. All right, thank you, Eric. Yeah, um, I mean, it, 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 pro-Trumpist. I mean, the, uh, I mean, part of what really distinguishes Roth, um, and I, in this this respect, even in comparison to a great writer like Saul Bellow, is um, is is that Roth is, uh, and he and he demonstrates this. It seems to me at the beginning of the Human Stain, a a, a, a truly brilliant essayist. And um, those two or three pages at the beginning of the Human Stain, capturing Clinton, um, is it seems to me one of the most um, um, uh, uh, extraordinary portraits 
of um, the, um, the, the Clinton um, uh, impeachment um, written by anyone. And um, so um, uh, I don't know to what extent it's credible to judge a novelist as to whether he, he or she tells the, the truth or, or not. Um, I mean, Roth was, has been savaged by many for speaking too um, often and too promiscuously about himself and uh, his own sense of his own uh, truth. Uh, a novelist isn't judged on the basis of that. A historian is. Uh, a journalist is. Um, you, um, you're, you really, the real, sale, the real significant question is to what extent the work is true to itself. And um, and so I, I don't quite un understand what Hemon is 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 saying, um, and uh, it, one of I think one of the the features of Roth's work is that his essays, in contrast to Bellows, continue to shine decades and decades later. I think he, as an essayist, he's as good as James Baldwin, who is I think one of the best essayists in the English language of his of his time. And at the same time, Roth is able to write, um, if you will, from both hands um, as a novelist and, and as an essayist. As an essayist, one expects him to tell the truth. As, um, as, a, as a fiction writer, the expectations are different. Nadine, pleasure being with all of you. And, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn off my computer and pick up a copy of the New York Times from a couple of days ago. Um, Thank you so much. Our next book club meeting will take place on May 20th. Our host will be NJIT professor John Curley, and we'll be discussing Nemesis. Uh, we're skipping the month of March because there's so much going on. Uh, the Philip Roth Society Conference at the Newark Public Library and also the Roth Festival in Newark. Um, all the information is on our website, prpl.npl.org, which I just put into the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. We've had a great crowd today and so many questions. And thank you, of course, to Stephen Zipperstein for leading this discussion or, and for letting us uh, address all of your many questions throughout this session. But uh, I just end by, by thanking Nadine, and I think all of us are in her debt. It's wonderful that she's in the position that she's in. She's a joy to, to, to work with. And I think all of us have benefited greatly from all the good work that she does. And so thank you. Thank you. Um, this meeting has been recorded and will be available on the Newark Public Library's Facebook page. And thank you also to Damani for assisting with the program. And I hope to reconnect with all of you at the next book club in May. And I hope to see some of you in person in March. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.